Welcome all. We're about to get started with the Bible study. Good morning. Well, I've got 35 slides this week. Are you ready for 35 slides? <laughs> yeah, and, and as you all know, what do I do better than most people? I talk fast, don't I? You know, I'm a little, I'm really um, kind of grateful that when we built the new church building, um, ADA, well, the state ADA code requires us to put within the context of our, our new sound system, listen, assisted listening devices. And so um, what that does is that as all the speakers, all the microphones go into the sound system, I think you guys kind of know this, in the back of the church, you'll be able to get an assisted listening device that you can plug right into your ear instead of having to listen to all that. And so those are not that expensive. And so we can get one where everybody that needs a listening device, especially Father James, um, can have that right in their ear and hear everything that's going on. But the new devices and the new systems are so great that guess what you're able to do? You know, Father James has this, uh, if you have uh, hearing aids, Father James has this device on his phone that allows the phone calls to go right into the hearing aids. So now the hearing aids on an app on your phone have Bluetooth technology, which our system will have, which will patch you right into the system so that you don't even need to use some dirty, grody thing that you have to clean every week with little things. You can use your own devices to be able to, you can put it right in there and even stick it right into your ear. Isn't that great? You can Bluetooth into the sound system. Well, let's get started this morning with a prayer. I haven't been starting with a prayer, and I want to do that. Let's, let's pray. The Lord be with you. Father in heaven, as we um, continue to look at finding uh, your, new pur your purpose in our life for this new season, we ask you, Lord, to help us to um, look towards our time and organizing our time for your purposes to be played out in our life. And today we also think about those relationships in our life. We pray that you would give us the people uh, in our life and help us to cultivate the relationships that we need in order to live in that abundant life in Christ. And so we ask for your blessing upon us today in you know, our hearts and our minds and our bodies. And we ask this blessing in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Let's see if I can. All right. Well, I wanted to kind of go over a little bit of what we've been doing so far to today, because on this journey, on this freight train of moving, finding God's purpose in our life, I'm guessing after three weeks, you might be asking yourself, Father Rob, you've talked about what we're going to do, the introduction to the class, about a rule of life being at the center of this class and this idea of finding God's purpose. Last week, you talked about time. This week, we're going to talk about relationships. When are we going to get to God's purpose? What we're actually doing here is creating a framework in, of understanding of the different areas that we need to be cultivating our life in order for us to get to that point where we can say, what are my hopes and dreams? How can I use my time most effectively, my relationships most effectively, the temple of my body, whether it be my physical health, my, my intelligence, uh, or even my emotional health. And then we're going to talk about how to use the resources. One on one side, how do I set my life up to be able to successfully uh, uh, follow through on God's purposes? What if there's a financial component? And secondly, there is that uh, development of our gifts and talents and asking about those. Now, the interesting thing about this class that I want you to know, and, and maybe I didn't share at the very beginning. So now that you're, you're going to get to the end of the class, and the end of this particular class is the beginning of your journey of finding your purpose, giving you that framework. And at the end of the class, you know what we're going to be doing in November and December? 
We're going to be setting up small groups for you to be able to actually talk with trusted friends. When I say we're setting up small groups, we're creating the environment in which hopefully these small groups can be created um, and with trusted friends, or even if you don't have a trusted friends, but new friends that can become trusted. But today is all about relationships. Yeah, you know what? Do you wanna know wondering I might be a little bit helpful because we're all hot, aren't we? Because I put the air conditioning down to about as low as it can go, but I'm wondering if you open this door and you can get a cross breeze coming in. Let, let's just see how that might work. And if it's too loud, I don't know. Well, is, is it too much fun? Okay. All right. So as we get to this, we're kind of looking at our class goals. These are the goals that we want to have in this class. We want to understand what we're passionate about today, but we're not at that, at that point yet here. We want to talk about quality use of time. We want to talk about growing life-giving relationships. We want to talk about caring for our bodies, not just the physical body, but the intellectual and the emotional body. Talking about being good stewards of the treasure so that we can successfully walk in that particular purposes God has for us. And then cultivating our talents and using them well. So that's just a, a brief little overview again of what we're doing here and where we're going. So this week we are on growing life, growing uh, life-giving relationships. And I want to start with a quote about friendships right here because well, I'm going to use friendships and relationships a lot interchangeably. But if you're like me, are friendships and relationships the same thing? No. What's, a, what's the difference between a friendship and a relationship? I play golf with three guys that I don't do anything else with, so there's no relationship. Okay. So is there no relationship or is there no friendship? Um, it's a... It's a friendship in the sense that uh, we're all comfortable with each other, mm -hmm. but uh, we don't impact each other's lives in any way beyond the golf. Mm -hmm. Can you be in relationship with someone that you dislike and have no intention of ever bringing into your personal inner circle? Yes. Yeah. They could be someone, they could be your boss. You know, that's the, that's the caricature, right? They could be someone that you work for. It could be a client. It could be your client of someone else. You have a relationship with someone. And we have all different kinds of relationships. But we don't have deep, meaningful, impactful relationships with, I mean, friendships with everyone that we have relationships with. And so when we talk today, what we're going to be talking about isn't so much relationships, because, but the importance of developing friendships so that you can do can can work towards two things. The first is that, well, let me, we're gonna get to the principles too. That's what we're gonna, so I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit. But I wanna share with you a quote about friendships. I just wanted to establish that today we're gonna be talking about the value of friendships and cultivating God's purposes for your life. Now the trouble, this is a great quote that I found on friendships uh, by Mark Twain. The trouble is not in dying for a friend, but in finding a friend to die for. How many of us feel that way in our life? This, this is a rhetorical question. If we are honest with ourselves, think about this. How many people in your life, okay, let's give a caveat. Besides your kids and your spouse <laughs> are worth dying for. I think about that. What in your life is worth dying for? Every one of us would say, my kids, my grandkids, my spouse, maybe even my parents, but most of us, our parents aren't, aren't with us. Amy, thank God your parents are, are still with us. Here's another quote from Tennessee Williams, a great playwright. Friends are God's way of apologizing to us for family. <laughs> How many of you would trust your life with, I would die for them, but I'm not going to trust my life to them, <laughs> right? Um, if you, you grow up in, I mean, a little bit of vulnerability, this 
I added this quote because it felt so personal that in my life growing up, this is just when that was perspective of experience and age helps you see things differently. But when you're growing up, like you're 19, 18 and 19, what you're saying in your life is that my family is so dysfunctional. And I hope this wasn't like your family that I'm trying to create in my life, the family I truly want. And they do that through friendships. And one of my, the key uh, components of my testimony in my life was when God showed me that I can have the, what a family should be through two things. One, a relationship with him through his son, Jesus Christ. And secondly, through cultivating healthy quality friendships. Now, I had one more uh, this one class on time was supposed to be before, but but now we're going to ask a little bit of a question. So we asked the question before, is there a difference between friendships and relationships? I want to know in your life. Let's talk about this just a little bit. I've been asking you to talk to a neighbor, but this isn't one of those things that talking to a neighbor. It's just calling out and sharing something. What are the different relationships that you have in your life? Talking about both friendships and relationships. No, we can talk. Yeah, family. Obviously, we got family. I have, and I say that a lot. And sometimes it feels to me that you have so many friends, and all that. No, I have so many acquaintances. Mm -hmm. Very different. Mm -hmm. And I we were talking to each other. I remember my son-in-law asked me one time. He said, "How many real friends do you think you have?" Oh, I said, "Maybe I have those." And, and he said, "Yeah, because the average person over there is like ten class close friends." Mm -hmm. You know, and I thought yeah. that was interesting. In one of these books, um, oh, behind the post. Uh huh. Oh yes, and I'm, we're going to talk a little bit about that. We're talking about vacation. I'm. I think that we need to okay, equate a vocation. Whether what we do isn't our vocations aren't just what we do to get money. It's the service groups that we belong to. It's the boards that we're on. Those kinds of vocational things. Um, I don't want to take the time to go into both of these books, but one of the quotes that, uh, that was in, I think it's in Crafting a Rule of Life in Chapter 8 on Relationships, it says that from a psychologist uh, who works with people says that, that um, a person can only have five real relationships. They can only manage them. I remember a friend of mine, uh, Amy uh, Victoria in, in Visalia. And so um, we talked about this. We said some people are like Legos. Some of us have the capacity to have 12 people, attachments. I can attach 12 different things on us. Some of us have the capacity, most of us are the ones that are six. Some of us are one. And there are those that are 12. But let's really, but looking at all those kinds of things, we have the capacity to have relationships. But I do believe that in the end, we only have the capacity to do very few relationships very well. And the question then, if we only have the capacity to do very few relationships very well, those are the relationships are the ones that, that are going to cultivate our life in such a way that we're going to thrive. I could have 50 relationships, but if I have no core friendships in my life, the likelihood that I have a well, a healthy, cultivated, balanced life in which I'm happy and joyful is not very good. In fact, those other relationships can keep me from actually having those quality friendships. And this class is really going to be talking to us about not about getting rid of those outside relationships, but the reality and the need for those core people to, in our life that we cannot thrive as God has intended us to thrive without having those as quality relationships. Can you think about the different relationships that you have that which if they were bad, it'll affect everything else? What are those? The easy one. What's the low fruit? What's the easy one? Your mother. Your mother. <laughs> it's always the mother. Well, 
I was thinking the spouse. <laughs> the spouse too. So if you're not having a very good relationship with your mother or your spouse, most everything else is going to be out of balance. Are there any other relationships that you can identify? Can we just assume we can, yeah. now we talk about father too, mother or and our father. Mother-in-law, father-in-law, kids. Mm -hmm. Mother-in-law, father-in-law, kids. Does anybody here have a best friend? What if your relationship with your best friend was faltering? Yeah, that would be impactful. Would it be impactful? For some of us, it might be devastating. I want to posit here within the context of where we're going later that, um, that it's vitally important that there's more than family members and spouse in your life, that if your relationship with that person was faltering, it should be devastating. What I mean by that, we'll get to later again, so, but I'm going to foreshadow this. You know, no one person can be everything you need in life. And in fact, if we can have five quality relationships, um, for those who are married, right, one's going to be a spouse, Second or third are probably going to be family members, but I would argue that we need at least two other people in our life that aren't spouse or family that, that feed into our lives and feed us in ways that the family and the spouse, one, can't. But here's an interesting thing. They're not intended to. When I do pre-marriage preparation, there's one, one of the things I talk to, to couples about and I said, now repeat after me. My spouse, my future spouse cannot be all things I need. Men need other men, friendships with other men. I firmly believe that. Women need friendships with other women. Some of us have these ways about us that, that the kind of friendship that we need is unique to us. But we can't be everything we can't be the only thing that somebody else has intimately involved in their life. Now, remember intimately in friendship terms, okay? I don't think, sometimes I'm like, I don't think I need to, to say that, but maybe I do. <laughs> so then let's ask this question, okay? We talked about who the important relationships in your life, but I put on here, what are the top five relationships that you have? So, but let's just talk about what's the most common Number one relationship people have. Their spouse. And now in this day and age, what might you say? You're significant other. Because there's so many people that aren't married, but in are in committed relationships. Okay. Mm -hmm. So whether you're talking theologically about those things, that's pretty much whoever your civic significant others is, is likely maybe 90, 95% of the time, right? The most important relationship that you have. But what are some other ones? Your best friend? Children. Your children. So, you know, what, okay, so we're having some common themes here. What are some things that we're not saying? What are some of the important relationships in our life that the world tells us are important that we have not yet said? God. Okay, yeah, we haven't said God. Now the world, yeah. <laughs> We are going to be getting into this idea that the number one relationship that we need to cultivate in our life is not our spouse, it's not our children, it's our relationship with God, okay? Below that, we're going to be looking at what's the next most important? Family, spouse, family. But underneath that, the next one, right? Our best friends. Well, what's the next level? What would you say? That one's the harder one. I don't know if I have the right answer to this one. What's the next level of relationships that we need to focus on? Maybe your acquaintances where you work. Mm -hmm. What's that? Workers. Your coworkers. See that your family. Your church family. Those significant places that you spend time outside the home. Some of us, it's it's what church. Some of us, it's work. Some of us, it's organizations that we belong to. So when we think about those kinds of relationships and friendships, we're talking about within the 
our life, we're talking, I mean, they could be in our top five. I don't think it's a very common thing. I don't think our top five usually goes outside. We rarely, rarely get to work with, at least vocationally, and get paid to work with our best friends. Am I right? Anybody lucky enough to do that? Great, Chris, tell me a little bit about that. What is work life like when you get to work with somebody? Well, let's give you a round of applause. <laughs> very fortunate that my college roommate and I eventually worked for the same organization that I worked for for the last 46 years. She became onto that because I went to many her as a physical therapist also mm -hmm. find the same organization I worked for. Anyway, she moved up through the ranks. As she was moving up through the ranks, she said to me, do you want to move up through the ranks? And I said, no, you're going to work on a computer and programs and stuff like that. And she goes, well, I don't feel like I'm qualified. And I said, well, you're qualified. I gave her all the qualifiers so she applied for the job because she couldn't figure out where qualifiers were. Anyway, she became the director of professional services. So she was my supervisor and boss. So I was very fortunate to be able to work with a very close best friend but we had to separate ourselves at work mm -hmm. because we couldn't have your best friend also be your boss and other people on the staff knowing that those two are connected. Mm -hmm. So we would, we, we would separate our friendship from our work life. Mm -hmm. We just had to do that. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't that difficult to do because we were in contact many times outside of work because we were very mm -hmm. good best friends. Let's take a quick look at this quote from sociologist Robert Bala. He says, Friendships, friendship is the most important and least examined area of human life. What do you think he means by that? When I say about that, what does that mean to you? Do you find that to be true? Have you ever thought about maybe the most important thing that you need to be working on in your life is not your vocation or your job, but your relationships? I think spouses are probably very clearly understand uh, on a very intimate level why that's true. Because when mama ain't happy, <laughs> there ain't nobody happy. But let's just, in a fa family unit, just when dad ain't happy, when kid ain't happy, when people aren't happy, ain't nobody happy. I, I always like the quote, you know, which I wish we could get older, you know, uh, you're only as happy as your most unhappy child. Mm -hmm. And I always thought that's true, even as mm -hmm. adults. Yeah. Like when our kids is experiencing problems with their children or health or whatever, mm -hmm. that's what it means. So you're only as happy as your most happy child. And I think at this point, it might be important for us to, because I'm talking about how to cultivate those kind of relationships. I think it's important. Like after the first week when I talked about that, when we want to find God's purpose and we want to change in our life, whether it's our fault or not our fault, it's going to require effort from us. But when we, there are often relationships in our life that we're called to work on that where the, the difficulty lies is not our fault. But let's talk about an unhappy child because let's talk about an unhappy child, a spouse or those kinds of things. It's vitally important for us to understand that there are oftentimes nothing we can do to change the unhappiness of that person. But it doesn't mean there isn't anything we can do to cultivate positive relationships. Do you guys, anybody want me to go further on that or does that make sense? To be, I, I'm just thinking about this. We're going to get into the biblical matter here. And we're going to get into this idea that, that our creation, the purpose that God created us, wasn't primarily to be stewards of his creation. What was it? Worship. To worship, to be in relationship with him. That the center core of why we were created was to be in relationship. And we're going to get to that biblical quote, okay? This quote right here, Helps us, I mean, understand that if the primary purpose for our creation, and if you look at the summary of the law, is to be in relationship with God and to be in relationship with those around us, 
then maybe the primary focuses of our lives need to be more about relationship building and not what we can produce as a commodity. There's this wonderful quote that I wasn't planning on here um, that I was listening to a podcast actually on, on toxic leadership. And one of the things about toxic leadership is that when the leader values outcomes more than they value relationships, then the whole thing is set up in order to exploit people in order to get an outcome you desire. And so I saw that within the context of this particular quote, and that, that particular uh, person quoting that was actually saying that the high quality and high powered leaders, the type A that we have put in, in place in our church, this was a church podcast because it was talking about the fall of significant mega church leaders. And there was a pandemic going on within mega church culture that in which that a disproportionate number of mega church pastors are falling from grace. And the reason is, is that they continue to have to prioritize uh, an outcome over the people that they serve. And then all of a sudden they become somebody who is only about the outcome. Now, if you're in a relationship, and we know this from experience, if you're only in a relationship for the positive outcome that you can get from it, what usually happens? It begins to break down. And then all of a sudden leaders and people begin to push people away because you're not producing the results that I want. Does that sound familiar, Amy? <laughs> And that's a criticism that I have to deal with within my life, not just at, at church. Actually, I think I'm better at it in church than, than other places. This is what I want to see with my kids. This is the, the result that I want. And so then, they, then this particular psychologist came in and talked about family life. And he said, we would have much healthier families if parents weren't focused on outcomes, on, but on relationships. I thought that was a really interesting concept because these are my expectations this is what i want you to do this is what i don't want you to do okay and the reality is is that parents need this was this was a quote that i'm that i'm working through that it was all about relationships it was about how to your kid is going to screw up just like you your kid is going to do stupid things just like you your job is not to stop those those things from happening but your job is so that when they do happen, the overall outcome is that the child learns in a positive, healthy way from those things and knows that no matter what happens in your home, in your life, that they're going to be loved and cared for. Do you know how much more you can do in your life knowing that at the end of the day, you've got a group of five people that no matter if you fail or succeed, they're gonna love you no matter what? So aren't then those five things are, are really going to be about what makes or breaks us. So therefore, like this, this quote here, that's why relationships are a primary concern. And so in this class, for these purposes, I'm going to challenge us to think about what it means to cultivate relationships before we cultivate outcomes or talent, because in the end, how many people on their deathbed said, I wish I would have worked harder and longer. I wish I retired later. What do they usually say? On their deathbed, people dying. What do people on their deathbed usually wanna say and do? They want, well, they're leaving more time with family. <laughs> people on their deathbed, usually want have a list of people they want to say goodbye to or make amends with. Mm -hmm. people, it's, not boss. it's not their boss. <laughs> it's usually not their boss. <laughs> All this is getting to the point of, I'm getting to a central point in this class today, that when we look for God's purposes in our lives, he wants us to understand and know that the outcomes of those purposes are not nearly as important as us ourselves. The most important purpose that God has in your life is that he has a relationship with you. And that's a quality relationship with you. Now we get back to time. Spending time with God, spending time with our spouses, 
saying no to other things so we can have those things. Finding that right balance so that what I'm saying is that this isn't just for the work life. You know, saying yes to the amount of hours that's reasonable, but no to the amount of hours that's unreasonable to um, like in vocations and those kinds of things and saying yes to your family and be over generous with your family with your time. Maybe the same way. And I'm just going to say, because your family can't be everything to you, you also need a friend in your life that, that's also. Now, here's another quote. This is Bonnie Ware. Remember, I just asked you this question. Here's the quote. Bonnie Ware is a palliative care nurse and a writer. She writes this. Letting friends lapse is one of the top five regrets people mention at the end of their lives. Many become so caught up in their own lives that they let golden friendships slip by over the years. There were so many deep regrets about not giving friendships the time and effort that they deserve. Everyone misses their friends when they're dying. I think you can flip that around too and say, you wish you had more time when they died. Mm -hmm. had yeah. Two really good friends that, that died some time ago. Mm -hmm. And I really was upset with myself that I didn't get to see them all. Mm -hmm. One in the Bay Area and one yeah. in the East. Do you mind if I take it a little bit further? It's going to be a little personal for you, Ed, and I apologize. But you look at that and you regret that. Yet you also love teaching, right? You absolutely love teaching in the sense that, and sometimes we go back and we regret, maybe I could have taught longer. But I'm guessing that you have much greater regret, not about teaching longer, but about those friends that you didn't get as much chance with. When we're in the middle of our career and our life, it's hard to see things that way. But when those things begin to happen, you know, we wish we can hit our old, younger selves in the head and say, spend more time on relationships. And even more so, you want to, like the rich man who says to Abraham last week, if you could just tell my kids, yeah. if you could just tell my grandkids. Chris, you were about to talk. Well, I was thinking when you said, what do people, when they're dying, they want to renew their friendships or their relationships and that kind of thing. I think the other thing people want to know when they are dying, they want that relationship with God. They desperately want that. They want to be forgiven. Mm -hmm. They want to quote go to heaven. So they desperately want that relationship to be there and they may have let it last. Mm -hmm. It's just another another thought. Exactly. Right there. Right there. Mm -hmm. They want that relationship with God that they may have not left, mm -hmm. but they want it there again. Well, they probably had a friend there with them. They may have, 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 they may have had a priest with them mm -hmm. on priest. that day also sure. to say, or they may ask for confession and forgiveness and sure. that sort of mm -hmm. thing. So I think they, many people on their deathbed want that relationship mm -hmm. with God that may have lapsed. It may have not lapsed. They may have that relationship and say, thank God I mm -hmm. have this. And I'm, I'm not afraid of God. Mm -hmm. They may have that also, but they may have the opposite. I can tell you as a priest who's been in a lot of deathbeds, very few times people who know they're dying, on rare occasions, they've asked for confession over something that they've done, you know, that, that you look at and you're like, yeah, that's a thing a priest would, you know, should never reveal or things like that. But that is like minuscule. What is the most common thing, once again, that, that people want to talk to a priest about? It's about the relationship they wish they had that are too broken for that person to be by their bedside right now. And they want to ask for forgiveness. They want to know that they're forgiven, even though they can't say it to that person because that person won't listen to them. I was just at a memorial service yesterday. There was a family that um, called our church because they're from out of town. Their brother died right before the pandemic died. And this is the time that they had to do the service and they were Roman Catholic. But guess what was happening yesterday morning? There was an ordination and every Roman Catholic clergy could not be there, but that's when they had to do it. I had availability, so I went there. And this is, it was rather frustrating to me as a priest who had no relationship with them because when they got to the time at the graveside, that they wanted, they started talking. Father James and I say two people. There's a reason for two people because it goes for an hour. But you know what happened in that hour? It was very frustrating to me, I'll admit it. 
But that entire hour was the everybody who was there, not just talking about the person, but they took they did something that I hope sticks. They asked forgiveness. There were three different people who asked for forgiveness from people that were present. That rarely happens. It's such a beautiful thing. And by, by the fact that I was available to do that, to give them that context, they were able to ask for forgiveness. Now, when we talk about cultivating friendships, the next few slides are about practical or spiritual things that are important in cultivating friendships. The first thing that we're going to talk about is if you want to cultivate a friendship, be a faithful presence in their life. Here's the quote. When we're willing to stay for the long haul, despite the challenges and shared experiences of life will strengthen us. What is different in our life? Sometimes we think about a spouse. Sometimes we think about a faithful friend. That when we're going through something very difficult, maybe we're at odds with that person to know isn't there something dramatically different if you're in an argument with, you know, with somebody it's, it's going to be okay. Even if it's a really deep argument, do you know what I mean by that? Knowing that that person's still going to be in your life and you're going to have a really healthy relationship after this argument, what does it help you do in that moment? Maybe it helps you argue. Well, it's when you're not so sure that things begin to fall apart. So practice a faithful presence. So it's that old Curcio saying, right? Be a friend. Practice being a friend. Instead of looking, it, here, I'm preaching to myself right here. Instead of looking for what you need to be filled, ask how I can fill their needs and what begins to happen. The needs you have begin to be filled. So go ahead talks about and we all have friends we say we have a lot of history together and i it becomes i mean i have a lot of friends i've had for over 50 years so we're so close friends and i think my friends have moved into retirement communities and they moved in for friendships so that their complaint is we have, i have no history with these mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so they're in the very service of shua the service friendship mm -hmm. because they don't feel that comfortable mm -hmm. themselves what about honesty and transparency? Honesty and transparency coupled, remember it's coupled with faithfulness to a relationship. They create creates relational trust. There are times in which we need to be honest and transparent with somebody in order to adjust the situation or really to get a desired outcome that's needed. How many of us have, have been in supervisory roles where we evaluated somebody? right? And you wanted to be honest and transparent with that person for the purposes, if you cared about them, for the purposes of them to be able to do their job better, correct? How many of you have been on the receiving end of that honesty and transparency in those situations? It doesn't feel so good. But you know you have a healthy worker when they take those things and all of a sudden you think about it in your life. I, I know David has done this many times. You can see you have a healthy quality worker when six months down the road, they took your input seriously. That means they probably have a decent relationship with you to know that they care, that you care about them. So you're getting them honest, transparent feedback, right? How many people, how many people should we really be honest and transparent with on a regular basis? Probably those people that we have relational trust with. Otherwise, if we don't have that relational trust, sometimes you can have a collegial relational trust. I respect you and therefore I'll receive that. But otherwise it's going to downgrade that relationship. But high quality relationships as you're cultivating them, you need to cultivate that as you cultivate that trust. It helps us to be honest and transparent. Every person needs someone in their life who's honest with them. Whom, when somebody, when, when you share that honesty with them, that person that's being shared with knows that you love them and care for them. How can you be that? How can you cultivate that in your life? 
honesty and transparency. Not <laughs> that's you can say I can definitely be honest and transparent with others. But think about how you can cultivate the relationship in which you can allow someone to be honest and transparent in your life because that will help you develop that greater relationship and trust with God and in the purposes that God has for you. Now, here's an interesting one, mutual submission. When both willingly submit to the needs of the other, not to control the other, at the expense of their own needs, the relationship provides beyond what both originally hoped for. Submission to God, first and foremost, is the basis of willingly submitting to the needs of others. Mutual submission to one another. I, I put it this way, that a, a healthy relationship is when two, between two people is when each of them has the other person's need at the center of their relationship. That way, that relationship isn't a 50-50 balance. What is it? It's 100 100. You're both working hard to the benefit and blessing of the other. Ooh, confession and forgiveness. High quality relationships, the ones that we need to sustain ourselves in our life and cultivating that positive, thriving life, that plan that God has for us, is a willingness to confess when we've done something wrong and to ask for forgiveness. We will hurt people that are in that inner circle of five. It's just going to happen. You'll have different opinions and different needs. It's guaranteed 100% of the time. I'm sorry I was wrong. Please forgive me. And I love you. Are richly blessed by God. Only from a posture of humble repentance will reconciliation occur. That's right here from, from this book right here. Chapter 10. Now here, talk about joy. Joy is, is something, biblically, if you look at the word joy, it's not happiness, is it? The biblical understanding and concept of joy is actually happiness, laughter, and tears all mixed together. Has anyone ever here seen, since you have kids, Inside Out? The whole concept of inside out is the young girl's brain trying to, there's core memories and there's, and there's different emotions. There's joy, sadness, disgust, anger, and fear. And joy is kind of the leader of all these things. And she's trying to protect the inner head, trying to, from any emotions that are core emotions that are other than joy. And she's convinced everybody else that it has to be joy, but this girl's going through adolescence and she's having some struggles and pain. She's going from a move to Minnesota to San Francisco. And this whole movie is about happiness or joy. That's her name. Trying to stop any other emotion coming in. But biblical joy is a lot like the concept of this movie. That at the very end of it all, joy along with everyone else understands the core memories of someone's life that lead to a joyful life have within them. A, a mix of all the different emotions and it's okay to have those emotions and so true friends when we have joy together aren't just people who laugh together and enjoy time together they're what they're people who cry together they're people that go through tragedy together so that when they come out on the other side it's like the sun shines bright you know bright, all the brighter so true joy requires two things someone else which to share that joy and secondly laughter and tears when the tears of distress are shared there are plentiful tears of joy so the next thing that we need to think about is listening and empathy something that when we are feeling isolated and alone it's really hard for us to have the relationships that we have in which we listen intently and in empathetically to each other these are the relationships that are the most robust and life transforming you know when you're looking at all these different kinds of things what is this telling you about relationships that they're not always 100 happy even the most important healthy ones and there's struggles and challenges in life that we need to get through and it's so vitally important that, that we have these well-maintained, high-quality core relationships.
Let me ask you this. What is our, uh, this should say R, not out. What, so uh, what's our attitude and outlook like though when we feel empty in our relationships? When we feel like they aren't present or the core relationships we're supposed to have are not happening. And the outlook is weak. Yeah. Where am I going to get filled up? Maybe there's empty. When quality relationships are scarce, it's the same thing, isn't it? One of the things that we're looking at in the DMM program about leading change, if you know, I, I had no idea this this particular program coming right at COVID. This is coming out of that program, really. And one of the things that we're looking at, and one of the things that this is doing right here, these core relationships, here's, here's if you're, even last week in the Times Delta, do you see that article of the dissatisfaction of teachers? Right, we talked about that before, right? And we talked about it last week. It's common in healthcare, teaching, first responders, uh, churches, any organization that deals with people. And what I think is going on is that whenever you go through a crisis, a prolonged crisis, here's something else that I knew that, that, that the average time span of a pastor in a church that's gone through a crisis, like a flood or a tornado, is that they finish the work of, of getting them through it and then they quit, okay? It's almost a year. You can set your watch by it. That person will not be there for very long. Problem is, is that we have been through this for two years, teachers and everyone else. But what we're finding here and what these concepts are telling us, these were not created for the pandemic, but they were created for that. They're showing us the answer to the pandemic stresses and strains have been there all along. And one of the key things that we need to think about is that those who come out well on the other side of these things, if you look in you know, the hospital, the teachers, those kinds of things, it's the individual who have high quality, healthy, personal relationships that help them get through those things. Much more often will you be able to endure those things. When friendships are scarce, we begin to be more self-centered, we get more haggard, we get more lonely, isolated, angry. You guys wanna list some other things? Those aren't the only ones. Yeah. <laughs> but when we have, with our attitude and attitude and outlook, when we have quality relationships, even in the midst of challenges, we're much more likely to be joyful thankful, giving, kind, content. I think I have more. Quality relationships changes everything on the outside of how we deal with the world around us. That doesn't mean that you should endure and just stick with a job that's toxic and unhealthy. But it does mean that you can get through um, a very difficult, challenging season of your life. That's why cultivating relationships are so important. Now, I said this before, principle number two that we wanna to do today is that no relationship will fill all your relational needs. We've talked about the different kinds of relationships that we have already, but here's a list. Here's a bunch that I came up with. God, spouse, children, grandchildren, wider family, best friends, close friends, acquaintances, colleagues, boss, subordinates, teammates, organizations, mentors. Am I missing any? Probably. Principle number three. Principle number two is that no one relationship will fill all your relational needs. Principle number three Thing. Cultivating relationships is more important than discerning your purpose. If the core of this class is to finding God's purpose in my life, I believe that it's vitally important that
that we place people in our life, that we place relationships first, because those relationships will help us to discern our purpose and get through the challenges of life in order to fulfill those purposes. Think about this. We were created by God, first and foremost, to be in relationship with him. Remember we talked about that already? This is our primary reason for being. And from this relationship comes our calling to be stewards of God's creation. We were not created, first and foremost, for a vocation of stewardship and service to a thing, to a created order. Jesus didn't say, the most important law is to be a good steward of God's resources. What did he say? To love God and to love your neighbor as yourself. Relationships are our primary reason for being. And so remember when we talked about time, instead of talking about what we need or what we want or what can I have, to focus our time on saying, on just being, abiding in Jesus. And that's at the core. That's why relationships are so vitally important. As we discern our purpose, we need to discern first and foremost, the most important things in your life are your relationships. Here's Genesis 1, 26 to 27. I'm just going to read verse 27. God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Let us make man in our image. That's usually defined by preachers and scholars as the first Trinitarian statement. That God, you know, that's what that comes from the Shema. The core statement of Christian faith, I mean, I mean, of Jewish faith is the Lord, our God is one. It also comes, it gives us continuity of several aspects. This is where we get the Trinitarian theology that there's Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in one God. And so God himself is in relationship and relationship is at the center of who God is. Therefore, at the center of the purposes that God has for us is relationship. We are created by God, first and foremost, to be in relationship. And from this relationship comes our calling, our purposes, to be stewards of God's creation. And God and our unique talents and abilities, we partner with God in those to find our place, to find our purposes. But God is not, when you get up to the pearly gates, he's not going to ask you first and foremost, did you complete the job? I gave you. What is he going to ask us? Do you love Jesus? Are you in relationship with me? That's going to be the key. That's why we say we are saved by grace, not by works. Our task then in finding God's purpose in our life. I love this quote from Susan Phillips in The, the Cultivated Life. I'll just say it here. Friendships are trumped in adult life by the demands of work and family within a culture of fragmented relationships and an ethos of self-determination. These cultural features serve the current socioeconomic structure. Turning down an appealing job offer in order to continue living near a friend is rare and baffling. People say, we're just friends. In affluent societies, we too often live to work rather than work to live. Think about that. How would your life be different instead of living to work that you lived for your relationships. So then what's the point of the entire session on relationships? When looking to find our purpose in life and creating a rule of life or our workout plan to fulfill that purpose, remember that cultivating strong relationships are more important than your purpose. Quality, healthy relationships are crucial to sustain our being and living out our purpose. That's the core of what we're learning today. What relationships are the most important to cultivate? Your relationship with God. Your spouse and family come second. Personal and spiritual friendships are third. And then your vocational relationships are fourth. Yeah. Those are what, from my reading and what I believe, those are the core ones from top down. I like the one God. But I believe that if God calls us to be married and have a family, it's like just below, <laughs> just below that one. I think uh, what's next? 
You have an assignment this week if you so choose to do it. This is just for your own cultivation. List the most important relationships you have. And then list, make time in your life to work on those relationships. Maybe first God and then your spouse. And then one or two close friends. Only one if you have a spouse. Two if you don't. Why? Because it's hard work. And I'm not saying that you should all start with five now. Start with God start and your spouse and then one other person in your life. I think that's what we have. Next week, we're going to talk about a rule of life and how we cultivate our whole body, mind, soul, spirit, physical, intellectual, emotional. All right, we got, are you guys got any questions for today? So Never. What's that? That does include pets. Pets. <laughs> yeah. You're really, that's a great question. You want to hear my thoughts on that? Sure. I often think that we form special bonds with pets because our relationships in life are so broken. Mm -hmm. And pets give us unconditional love and care. Now, even if you have high quality relationships with people, I still think it's a really healthy, wonderful thing to have a pet. I think, you know, I mean, too many of us have pets because we can't have quality relationships. And if you know that you can't, a pet is a great place to start and have. But don't let that relationship, sometimes you just say, to heck with everything else, I'm just focusing on the dog, okay? Because people stink. <laughs> yeah. Just like everything else, there's unhealthy attachment to animals and very healthy attachment to animals. And you are doing a blessing of the animals. Thing. Next week, 4.30, blessing of the animals. Yeah. Great, yeah, just right out here on the grass, right out in front, right over here, just bring them out, we'll bless them. We'll have a very short uh, um, liturgy. It'll be a wonderful time. It'll be no more than about 20 minutes. Bye, everyone.